Hello everyone, and uh, welcome back to the channel. This is Carrier Junior, uh, bringing you another video playthrough series. Uh, we're back with the Victory at Sea Pacific, and uh, <coughs> we have completed uh, our first video series, uh, which was playing the um, U.S. campaign. That series was uh, 20 parts. And uh, then I also did a 21st part, which was essentially a game review or commentary uh, of my thoughts of the game with all its uh, positives and negatives and my <coughs> desires or wishes for the game coming going forward. Uh, so do check out uh, that video for sure if you guys uh, are new to the game and uh, <coughs> uh, I would start from there and um, because it has a good overview of the, of the game and uh, what I think about it after having completed a US campaign. Um, the other video I would recommend is the first video in the US campaign series which is an introduction to the game and it, um, it basically goes through the basics, uh, the tutorial and the basic mechanics of the game um and then uh yeah feel free to check out the US campaign where uh, which was played on medium and uh, at this point I would like to thank uh everybody for supporting supporting me and the channel um uh, as i mentioned this is my the first game and the first time i'm uh, doing youtube and um I thank everybody for the comments uh, and the likes and the subscriptions. I think we're up to 25 subscribers. Uh, and everybody has to start somewhere, right? So I'm thankful and glad you guys enjoyed the series. And uh, um, thank you for the comments because I've learned as much from you guys. Uh, and I hope you guys learned something along the way as well. So moving on. Uh, so. In the game, we still only have the campaign option. Um, we do not have anything else. I believe the developers have been working on um, <coughs> uh, patching the game as uh, trying to fix the bugs. Uh, as you can see, as you might have noticed from the U.S. campaign, um, there's a lot of bugs. There still is a lot of bugs in the game, um, and I know there's some uh, people who are deferring playing the game further um, before. They um, they fix the bugs, which is understandable. Um, but as I've said many times, I'm, I even though there is a lot of bugs in the game, I'm thankful that the developers have put it out, uh, uh, even if it was a little premature, um, so that we can enjoy the game. And I have definitely enjoyed it so far, even with all the bugs. So as you can see, we're in patch 1.1.2p1. Like you can see at the bottom here. Um, I do not run the the beta version, um, so I do run the 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 full version, the latest public version of the game. Um, somewhere towards the end of the U.S. campaign, uh, they released the Japanese campaign, so good timing on that. So we'll go ahead and click on campaign. Uh, the British campaign is still locked. Um, <coughs> we did complete the American, and so we're just going to go ahead and uh, click on hard. And um, we're going to go with the Japanese campaign. Um, this should be quite interesting because uh, this essentially, uh, as I have stated in my commentary or review video, uh, the whole premise of the Pacific Theory of War was that the U.S. was uh, um, outnumbered and outgunned at the beginning of the war and was surprised. The Japanese uh, actually expanded very rapidly into Southwest Asia and the, the British uh, and the Allied fleets in, in Southwest Asia were just no match for, for the Japanese carriers and the Japanese Navy in general. Um, and they expanded very rapidly, um, and it was just the sheer determination of the United States and the Americans that uh, uh, reeling from the Pearl Harbor attack shock 
um, essentially um, as Admiral Yamamoto the commander-in-chief of the Japanese Navy uh, predicted is the awaken a giant which is true and uh, it actually that that act united the Americans and um, both in production and in enrollment in the Navy um, the, Jap the Americans just came back strong and pushed back and then um, throughout the campaign both in historically and in the game uh, the the Americans um, slowly but surely uh, tipped the balance of the war to the point where the Japanese had uh, no more had almost no competent pilots had no planes had very little production they had they were not able to replace their pilots their planes their ships and they kept losing ground and it just became easier and easier for the Americans at least at sea to gain naval superiority and air superiority um, the Marines uh, still face challenges assaulting all the islands um, but uh, so it's gonna be very interesting it's gonna be a quite a bit different tactic because the Americans all they had to worry about is one front they had to worry about Hawaii Johnston uh, Atoll and uh, Midway Atoll and uh, all the, in the Aleutians I guess but nobody, nobody really cared about the Aleutians I don't think very much so they were able to focus uh, around the home islands uh, I should say and the and then they were able to push the southwest and uh, go from there whereas the Japanese have to contend with the, the British in the west the Australians in the south the Americans in the east the Chinese in the west and the Soviets in the north I mean though they were not at war with each other so they have a huge area to cover and um, as I had said in my previous video concentration of power is not gonna be a thing uh, I think uh, anyways uh, I'll comment as we go um, but not only am I increasing the difficulty so it should be I assume that this means um, the enemy I, in this case it's gonna be the US is gonna be producing a lot faster they're gonna be having larger groups of fleets to uh, defend against or you know to, to contend with and not only that so I'm doing two things I'm uh, increasing the difficulty and at the same time I have a huge empire that's stretched thin I would say so it's gonna be very interesting to figure out where to concentrate forces and uh, how to deal with that with the supply lines and uh, with our you know where where to focus so let's get ahead started let's go ahead and get started and click on the Japanese campaign let's see the other thing that uh, uh, one of the comments I've received in the US campaign is that the videos are quite long uh, many of them I would say the average was anywhere between an hour and a half and two hours uh, per video and the reason for that is I um, I don't accelerate time so to 200 or 500 or 1000 times in the map view and so things take longer and um, I basically didn't want to um, I wanted to be as efficient as possible and the US campaign kind of proved that because I only lost I think 10 subs um, I think it was 3 DDs and 2 cruisers the whole campaign um, and those are mostly due to negligence and uh, not knowing what I was doing um, whereas if I had sped up time you know I would have probably lost a lot more units but probably gotten through the game faster um, so yeah state of war so let's see to ensure the survival of the greater east asian prosperity sphere we must conduct a preemptive strike on our enemies though they are not currently moving against us once we attack a nation then that that nation will declare war on us well duh <laughs> okay so we are in hiroshima which is kind of um ironic because this is where history has changed uh, with the dropping of the atomic first atomic weapon um, which I think killed like 300,000 people and um, 
this and the bomb in Nagasaki basically ended the war. So it's a little ironic that this is where we start. So it will be very interesting to see how this pans out. So let's click OK. We have a new but new objective. Uh, hold strategic ports to force the allies to sue for peace. Hold strategic ports. Okay, that's interesting. So we're not jumping straight into the Pearl Harbor attack. Um, so let's see what the... Attack the American naval base at Pearl Harbor. Never mind. <laughs> so we do have... To, that is where we start. So, I don't know how that's defending uh, strategic ports, because that's attacking an enemy port in an enemy nation. Okay. So, let's, uh, let's have a look around here. Hiroshima. <coughs> and uh, guys, in this one, uh, in this playthrough, I since it's a whole new nation, I'm just going to take it a bit... Um, a bit easier as far as just advancing and just enjoy the game a bit more and see what it has to offer like check out some of these bases for example so we can see here we have like all this housing and so this is like a the city of Hiroshima we have searchlights uh, we have um, AA emplacements uh, these are presumably factories oil tankers or oil tanks Large, o large oil storage and small oil storage. What else we got? <laughs> so here we have the uh, some sort of a shipyard or dock. We got containers. Um, so this is some sort of port at Hiroshima. We do have uh, torpedo boats, which is a classic. A standard defense uh, force in all of these ports. We have 15 inch coastal guns, so this must be a major port. Look at the size of this thing. What else? All sorts of these big guns. And then we have the airfield and then more of Hiroshima okay um, oh here we go control tower so uh, as you can see the graphics are not anything spectacular in fact uh, I think as soon as I get the bugs uh, fixed in the game especially the aircraft control I think one of their main focuses uh, should be just to improve the modeling of you know and the graphics in this game because um, I think there's room for imp definitely room for improvement so what else so we seem to have what are these cargo ships and some sort of fleets. Okay, so that's Hiroshima. And that is, I don't know what that is. Kure. Kure was, I think, one of the main ports, main uh, naval ports that Japan had, uh, shipyards. In fact, we can see a ship dock right there. All right, perfect. So this is how Japan looks. And uh, now we can go and uh, check out what's happening in the map view. Alrighty. It's quite uh, quite interesting to see this from the uh, the other end right now, because uh, I can almost see like what are what are these guys? Five submersibles. Do you guys remember the, f the submersibles that um, we kept uh, seeing popping up uh, around here? Well, now we're on the other side, and uh, we can direct them to scout out. Um, 
We've got tankers, we got major pork of truck, two cruisers. Got the whole southeast to take care of. All the Dutch Indies. Um, Philippines. Wow. So. <laughs> a lot of territory that needs to be captured here. Torpedo boats. Submersibles. 14 destroyers, 1 cruiser, and 4 heavy cruisers. Okay. Okay, we're gonna go through that here. I'm just, uh, just doing scouting here, just seeing what, how things are looking. So, let's go through our task forces and see what we got. We always have a lot more than uh, the, what the US started for, but I just presume these are all small task forces that, um, can't really do much by themselves. So, so here we have Task Force 15, which has the four cruisers, and they're near Iwo Jima. Task Force 3 is near Japan. We've got the Fuso, Yamashiro, Ise, Hyuga, Motsu. So this is our battleship force. Congo, Haruna, which are CC, I think uh, these these are like the fast battle cruisers, I guess some consider them, I think CC would be a battle cruiser um, some people consider them fast battleships, some consider them battle cruisers um, I would say they're just fast battleships because they have decent armor and I think they have 14 inch guns so I think that's a little out of the cruiser category. The Tago and the Takao, which are the heavy cruisers. Oi, I think, is a yeah, is a uh, torpedo cruiser. And then one DD. So decent force there. Four is the Nagato, which is uh, one at some points of the war there. It was the flagship. Uh, I think Yamamoto was on it uh, on a Pearl Harbor attack, if I'm not mistaken. And um, cruiser with it. Oh, and this is also here in uh, on the home islands. Task Force 13 is near truck, it's uh, two light cruisers. Task Force 6 is four cruisers near Formosa. Task Force 9, oh my god. A crap ton of DDs. And, um, so this is like a cruiser force and they are they are um, <coughs> near Hainan okay task force 10 is uh, submarines Task Force 1, Ooh. well, that's the mobile strike force. They are north of Japan right now. So Task Force 1 has, um, is the mobile strike force. So, for those of you who are new to the Pacific Theater, um, This is actually quite historically accurate. So, the Japanese had a what they called a mobile strike force, which was, um, which was quite revolution in concept. Uh, I think it was at the time the most powerful mobile uh, force, military force uh, in the world, and uh, I think it had uh, various divisions of carriers, and each division had two carriers in it. And um, <coughs> so here you and Soryu are division two. Shukaku and Zuikaku are division five. Kaga and Akagi, which I don't know, they're not in this group, 
our division one so that's and then we have a bunch of cruisers and DDs supporting this task force so we have five CVs and I think um, in the Pearl Harbor attack there were uh, six right there was the Akagi as well um, so I don't know where the Akagi is Task Force 11 is uh, two light cruisers. Task Force 12, two DDs. They were also in the homelands. Task Force 8, oh my god. <laughs> One, two, three, four, eight. Eight subs in the Marshall Islands. That is quite interesting the amount of subs that the Japanese had. Interesting because the subs, I, as far as I know, they didn't do much in the war. It was the U.S. subs that sank about half of the entire shipping, the uh, cargo shipping of Japan, and was were quite instrumental. Task Force Two. It's near Midway. Is the five submarines we talked about? Chitose is an. Chitose is um, AV, an AV. Okay. I think that's uh, an aircraft cruiser or a sleep seaplane tender, either one. Um, so they're auxiliary ships, they're not meant for war. And they just carry seaplanes and uh, ferry planes from uh, for supporting uh, land invasions, assaults. And Task Force 5 is another huge task force. The Kitekami, which is a torpedo cruiser, so 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 cruisers, and a whole bunch of DDs. And these guys are at uh, near Kure, I think. Oh no, they're near Sasebo, Western Japan. And then we have four um, subs here. Okay. So what do you guys notice immediately? I noticed that any of these task forces alone, if faced against a carrier, a, an American carrier, or against British battleships, or heavy cruisers, they would all get decimated. So, there's quite a bit of redeployment that needs to happen here. And um, it's going to be quite interesting on how we choose to do that. The first thing is that Japan obviously does not need to have all of these forces because the idea is we are going to push. So, if you guys remember the US campaign, what did I do? I had a center force, had a southern force to push the south, the center to push the center Pacific, the northern force to defend the Aleutians, and then a home force to defend the home islands, right? So you, you have to think similarly, except we have a lot larger area to cover. So we're gonna do the same, and uh, probably I'm thinking we're gonna have a west fleet that takes out Hong Kong and the Philippines and then pushes to take Southwest Asia so that's when we're going to need a Western fleet and uh, <coughs> what we're going to do is gather everything we have um, go for Hong Kong and the Philippines and just have a some, uh, somewhat of a concentrated force there the other thing, so that will be the Western Force. Now the Western Force will then push to the Southwest because once these are ours, there is no way, there's no need, there's going to be no need. These are going to be the front lines. So we're just going to push front lines and not and only have like a smaller 
force in the back there to defend the, the other areas. Uh, and then the western force is just going to keep pushing towards the Dutch Indies and towards the West Australia. So that's the western force. Then I'm going to call the, and I'm going to have a central force. The central force is going to start pushing from. Um, it's going to go here and take Guam, and then it's going to push push into New Guinea, and then we're going to push into the Solomon Islands, and then Eastern Australia. Fiji, Ellis, and once all that's done, they're gonna start heading back towards the U.S. So, imagine you know, channels, right? So, the Western Channel that pushes like this, a Central Channel that pushes like this. And then, what's left is a Northern one which pushes the Aleutians and then what I'm gonna call a main force and the main force is gonna take wake um, actually no, the main force is the mobile force and then it's gonna go straight and attack Pearl Harbor and then it's gonna attempt to take uh, Midway, Wake, and Johnston. Now I don't know how that's gonna work because uh, let's see what are our objectives. So our first objective is Pearl Harbor. So let's see what the game tells us to do. Singapore. So our next objective would be Singapore. So they want us to push the southwest after Pearl Harbor. Then they want us to push Wake Island. Kendari, so another southwest Rabaul. They want us to push into New Guinea. Timor. Amen. So all of the Dutch East Indies lie, which is New Guinea. Lion Salamaua, Adak, which is the uh, Aleutians, Atu, again, uh, Tulagi. So Tulagi is the Solomon campaign, Guadalcanal. That's it. That is very interesting. So they want us to push all, they want us to push through Southwest Asia, the Dutch Indies, New Guinea, Solomon Islands. At the same time, I think they want us to push through the Aleutians and then also through the center, take Wake. So they're not telling us anything about Midway or Johnston or Hawaii. Because obviously those are uh, those are it's like that's basically like attacking the U.S. itself. Okay. Now, okay, those are defense forces. We looked at our task forces. Let's look at our ports. Wow, we have a ton of ports. So we do have the Marshall Islands. So I think the Marshall Islands is going to be one of our staging areas. And it's a basic port. So truck. This this is what uh, our center force. So west force, center force. Uh, southeast force. Northern force and main force. Okay. Yep. 
But yeah, that's what we're gonna have. West Force, North Force, Center Force, and uh, South Southeast Force. We're gonna go with four forces right now. The Center Force is gonna attack Pearl Harbor, and then they're gonna retreat, uh, resupply, probably a truck or something. And then we're gonna basically support the Southeast, and then go for wake and, and, and basically defend this area here. So as far as ports, we have Shanghai. Okay, which is a small port. Cebu, which is a large port. Kure, this large port, I'm pretty sure. Yep. Maizuru, large port. Yokosuka, obviously a more major port. Tokyo, yep. Truck, which is a small port. Nagasaki, big port. And Hiroshima. Big port. So we have a ton of ports compared to the US. US only had uh, three, three big ones and one small in Pearl Harbor. So we definitely have an advantage here, but we have a lot of area to cover as well. So it's all going to be about how we focus our forces. Uh, we did look at our objectives. We do have quite a few convoys. So we're getting 250 war bonds per month, supply fleets 2 per port, okay. Alrighty, now let's take one of these ports and see what the units we have. Uh, let's take... Take, um, I think Yokosuka is going to be one of my main. Alright, so we got the T1 torpedo boat. Oh yeah. okay. The Kinesaki class cargo ship. So it does 50 knots. So it's faster than the Liberties. 13 days to build. Pretty cheap. Akatsuki class destroyer. So it's got local AA01. Barely no armor, barely no damage. Very fast very small range. We got the Fubuki glass. Um, and if you guys mm, are aware or know, should know, um, or might know I should say, is Japanese where their strength was torpedoes. Whereas the Americans were r very behind in torpedo technology. So their destroyers were mostly torpedo boats. So the Fubuki has Crap AA, these long lines torpedoes, right? They're long range torpedoes. Uh, and then, same thing, no range but fast. Shiratsu, yep, they're slower, less range. Tenryu class light cruisers, we've seen these in action when we went against them, they're useless. I guess uh, they do have AA and they're cheap so we're gonna use them as AA boats um, oh and I forgot to check out to oh well, the Akatsuki is huge so the Akatsuki has one depth charge so all of these have depth chargers so their main use is just going to be anti-DD, whereas this light cruiser has got AA as well, um, armored deck. Okay. So you can use the Tenryu as an AA platform. The Kuma, it's a light cruiser. These guys are fast, aren't they? 33 knots. 
says the Kuma doesn't have a lot of um, AA, and these things have, but it has a lot more range. But they're so quick to build. <laughs> 20 days to build these things. So these things are essentially enhanced destroyers, right? So the only reason to have them is for AA cover or for anti-DD, right? But you don't need a million of them. You're not going to use them for anything else in this game. Okay, so and they're fast, which is another good thing. Um, they're good for harassing, I think. That's what the Japanese used to do, and I think that's what we're going to do. We're going to scout and harass with these guys. The Nagara class cruiser, 36 knots, medium range, no A, damage 16, yeah. So this thing is good for, it's not even good for AA or anti submarine. So I don't know what good they're for, except scouting maybe. Sendai class, interesting. The Sendai class. More expensive, crap range, good speed, um, no AA, no bad AA, but it's got oh, but it's got a plane. That's good for scouting. Uh, and it's got torpedoes, which again, don't use torpedoes much in this game. Okay, then we got the Hey Gada C1 class submersible. So, comparable speed to the Gato class, I think the Gato does 21 surfaced. Huge range, which is I think what uh, why the Japanese have so many of them. They're, I think we're gonna keep building these for um, scouting. That's the main thing. Scouting and uh, taking out uh, enemy carriers. It's gonna be what, what these guys are we're gonna do quite a bit of that actually. The Kashino class ammunition ship. Okay. So the US only had cargo ships and uh, oil tankers. Whereas here we have a new class, which is an ammunition ship. They're quite slow, medium range, cost quite a bit. They do have uh, decent two guns for the, to defend themselves, but um, I assume this will unburden the other. This is for the uh, land invasions, I assume. And also, I assume they carry ship and uh, aerial ammunition, right? The Ma Ma Mar or Mamiya class cargo ship. So this one is faster, medium range. Okay. Troop ship. Oh my God. See, we didn't, the U.S. didn't have any of this stuff. I don't know how we use these guys. I assume that... Yeah, I'm not sure. Guys, if you know what these troop ships would be used for, let me know. I assume it's to support the landings. And uh, things like the Guadalcanal, right? But we never needed them in the U.S. campaign. Uh, some sort of Maru Kawasaki class oil tanker. Well, that's self-explanatory. Huge range. <coughs> Chitose class seaplane tender. So that's what the AV stands for. I think. I think that was one of the. Uh, uh, remember, I said there was either a seaplane tender or a an aviation cruiser. Well, I think they're. So they're able to carry seven flights. They're supposed to carry only seaplane, but the game I think allows you to carry. When they say seven flights, you can carry. Oh, but it's this symbol here. Oh, never mind. I don't think you will be able to switch these for any other aircraft. These are just uh, scouting planes. Um, besides that, they don't seem to be good at anything else. The Aoba class is like um, kind of a medium range speed. This one is a modern cruiser. As you 
got torpedoes, they've got uh, scout planes. Pretty expensive. Furutaka, fast, medium range. Crap A. I'm curious to see like if you upgrade the A on these if they actually become useful. It's got eight inch guns. So these are heavy cruisers. Mogami class. Eight inch guns. I think the nineteen um, thirty nine version of the Mogami had fifteen five inch guns. Whereas this one seems to have ten eight inch guns. Uh, torpedoes, planes, medium range, fast. So the Japanese ships do appear to be quite fast. And then here we have the Hiryu class carrier. So it's fast, good range, 12 5 inch guns, AA strength. Yeah. So basically, I don't know how much we are supposed to rely on this because obviously these carriers have decent AA, but here saying zero AA, right? So they got 12 5 inch guns. So I think once you upgrade them, they're going to have good, good AA. So I think the same applies to all those other cruisers that show no AA. So the Hero class, uh, it's a fleet carrier. This can carry four uh, torpedo, oh, sorry, it's four dive bombers, four torpedo bomber wings and six fighters so a total of um, 14 flights compared to most uh, US carriers could do any, anywhere between 20 to 24 so it's quite considerably less which is historically accurate I mean most carriers were lucky to have uh, 60 planes whereas most uh, uh, U.S. Pl uh, um, carriers like the Yorktown would have 72 at the beginning of the war and then ended up having over 90 at the end of the war. So they used to build, oh wow! That is significant actually. So if you guys remember, um, the U.S. carriers used to cost over 300 war bonds. They took, I think it was, I want to say over 70 days to build, like 75 maybe. So these build faster. They're fast, they're very fast ships. So I think that's one of the advantages of the Japanese, like with a bunch of cruisers and they can really do good speed. Um, okay. So 59 days to build, okay. Soryu class, well the Soryu and the Hiryu are kind of sister ships. The Hiryu came after the Soryu, just slightly modified. Uh, it seems to have better guns and AA, obviously. More range. Interestingly, they cost the same. So, I have no idea why anybody would build Soryus. If they cost the same, take the same amount of time. They have the same speed, whereas the Hero is just uh, have a little more range and more guns. So, don't think we're going to be building many Soryus. And we got the Congo class battle cruiser. That's the CC designation. Cost a crap ton of money. Takes forever to build. They're actually. They're not as fast as, say, the. I think that's close to the speed of a North Carolina. They're not a crazy range, good damage, good armor. And I think once you upgrade the AA, they're good. They've got armored deck, so they're harder to. This means that it takes a lot longer to take these guys down, and we are well aware of that. 
in an easy class battleship wow these guys are slow I wasn't aware of that they're slow they have just about the same armor they do a little bit more damage um, similar AA got 12 14 inch guns versus 8 14 inch guns Four and then they've got 16 secondaries wow they have a lot of secondaries so these guys might be really good for AA defense but they're gonna slow the entire fleet down then we got the Kaga class which appears to be the cream of the crop here for the Japanese cost a crap ton more than say a Hiryu, almost twice as much as a Hiryu or Soryu and uh, it's slower the Hiryu does 34 knots it's got really crap range compared to the Hiryu which does 10 and the Soryu does 7000 got good damage because it's got a crap ton of 8 inch guns and 5 inch guns so this thing has similar firepower to a cruiser and armor so a Kaga class carrier can actually be used as a heavy cruiser <laughs> which is insane so you should remember that right see these do 40 damage this does 87 damage and this damage is from guns uh... it's not very good it doesn't have a armored deck these guys only have torpedo belts so they're vulnerable to uh... dive bombers and i think it carries more planes so these guys carry um, and i assume like just like the u.s. you can swap all these out So, 14 flights versus 18 flights. So, it's still not quite. I think even the crappiest fleet carrier will have at least 20 flights in the US. So, but this is the closest they've got. Um, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. Sorry, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. So why is this? Oh, that's the airfield. Oh my god, that airfield has a lot of bombs. I thought this was the carrier for some reason. Wow. So Japanese airfields, wow. Pretty amazing. And all of these are unfortunately locked out. So, I and that's the Yamato boys and girls I wish I could uh, see what those stats because that uh, we're definitely gonna have Yamatos in this game uh, I don't know these look like uh, that's another this uh, sub these look to be like more modern um, destroyers Cruisers, another sub, destroyer, cruiser. So a lot of uh, modern destroyers and cruisers. So so far we've seen the Soryu, the Hiryu, and the Kaga. So we have three more carrier classes here, and with this is four. So this one is smaller, so this might be a light carrier, like the Shoho or the Ryujo. So this one looks like the Akagi to me. That's probably one of their more powerful. It's like a bigger version of the Kaga, I think. And then uh, this looks like a Nagato. And this looks like the Zuikaku or Shokaku class. That's the Yamato. And 
Now, if one of these is the Nagato, I can't quite tell. If one is the Nagato, then the other is another battleship that's um, Namagi, maybe? Could be. Anyways, these are high end. That's probably the Nagato, and this is probably like a fast battleship of some sort. It's just below the uh, Yamato, and that's that's definitely is gonna be the Shokaku or Zuikaku, or it could possibly be the Taiho. Uh, at the time, the Taiho was the most modern, biggest uh, ship or carrier that the Japanese lost. It was um, it's better than the Shokaku and Zuikaku. It's bigger, could carry more planes and it was lost in the Battle of the Sil Philippine Seas. Then they had the Shinano, which was a converted uh, Yamato class, uh, and it was, but it was mainly used to ferry planes. It wasn't used for combat, but it was actually bigger than the Taiho, and it was constructed. But uh, I don't think those are in the game, so this is either a Taiho or a Shokaku class. That's probably the Akagi, and then these two, as I said, they're two probably uh, light carriers. So I'm thinking uh, Ryujo class or something of that nature, just smaller carriers. All right, guys. Oh, sorry, that does was these guys. Oh no, I didn't hear you. Yeah. So. That's a good overview of uh, the Japanese units. Um, actually, what we could do, just to finish up uh, this episode here, is let's take a look at some of these uh, ships. Agato. Again, I think flagship of the mobile force there at one point. And the Maya, which appears to be a uh, Mogami class or Miyoko class cruiser. Task Force 1, let's go check these guys out. That's our biggest task, that's the mobile striking force, or mobile fleet. Here's the Hiryu. Or you. So the interesting part here is that while the US had to wait a long time to unlock the more advanced carriers such as the Essex class, the Lexington and all these other ones, um, especially the Essex, I think the Lexington they already had one. Here we have some of the higher end ships which are already here but we haven't unlocked them yet. For example, the Shokaku, which is one of their top carriers. You can see here, definitely lacking in uh, aircraft compared to the US counterparts. So they've got the D3As. Yeah, we didn't look at the uh, fighters. We're going to do that just before ending this video as well. K so K torpedo bombers, zeros and valve dive bombers and then Zuikaku Kaga, EA so these are Congo class battle cruisers Oh, look at that. 
is a nice looking cruiser. Uh, what are these? 8 inch guns, wow. So it's got all the uh, main guns in front. So this is an aviation cruiser as they call it. Uh, so it has all of its main guns in front of the ship. In the back of the ship, uh, they have removed the turrets to accommodate more planes. So we need to take advantage of this uh, for scouting purposes. Um, the Japanese scouted from used uh, these seaplanes to scout instead of sending their carrier-borne uh, planes to scout. So that was as opposed to the U.S., which used uh, SPD had had SPD uh, dive bombers scout squadrons, and that's they're called VS squadrons, and. Um, that's uh they use their own planes to scout all right so that's our uh, mobile fleet guys it's missing the akagi but we have five carriers oh my god this having this type of a fleet early on is quite something But then again, I think the U.S. has uh, the Yorktown, the Lexington, and uh, the Enterprise are right early on. They don't get the Hornet till later, uh, and the Saratoga. They have four carriers as well, so as long as we do a concentration of force, we can actually take out some of their carriers early on, and uh, and then they won't have much right to push back. I think we have to be aggressive here the beginning and then once we see that they're building forces up we're gonna retreat uh, I said the last thing I wanted to promise to show you guys here is the airplane so let's go back to Yokosuka oh wow hello planes what are you F1 M Pete so you are a scout plane HK H8K Emily, so you are you are kind of like the Catalinas. Um, you can be an ASW, a bomber with six damage, or a torpedo bomber. Okay. And you have three thousand eight hundred nautical miles of range. That is insane. That is absolutely insane range. We got the. Mitsubishi, what are you, a fighter? You look like an old fighter. The Val is the di their dive bomber. 730 miles. The Kate is their torpedo bomber. Slow, but more range. So, as opposed to the US, uh, where the dive bombers have, they had better dive bombers, the SPDs used throughout the war compared to their TBD devastators here the Cates are actually pretty good they have more range they're slower than uh, the Val where is the Val so the Val is a little bit faster but it's uh, lower range the Kate is lower more slower but higher range and then we get the zero. Mm, fast. Oh my god, look at that range, guys. Dogfight strength three. So this is equivalent of like a, a Hellcat, which the US is not going to get for a while. So we got to make sure we take advantage of that superiority and gain. We have to be aggressive, guys. Otherwise, we know how it ends. <laughs> the only thing that uh, outbeats it in an air is the Corsair. So we have to make sure we. We have to use either, either numbers or something else. Um, these, I don't know. I think they're just improved uh, torpedo bombers and uh, die bombers. I am not as familiar with the Japanese planes. That's a float plane, an improved float plane. That this one, I think, is their uh, twin-engine medium bomber. 
and uh, which probably has a crazy amount of range. These are probably the improved torpedo bombers and um, dive bombers. Yeah, if you look at the uh, symbol here, this is a dive bomber, and that's a torpedo bomber because it looks similar to. Uh, or actually, I don't know. We'll have to see, guys. We'll just have to see. All right, guys. Um, I think I already went over <laughs> too much time talking, but I wanted to. Uh, you know, you guys know me. I'm, uh, I'm all about the uh, the historical relevance and you know looking at things more detail than just you know going and shooting things down. Um, so yeah, this is this is a quick overview of all. Uh, the Japanese forces, uh, bases, uh, units, and where they stand in the war. And um, I think I, I I promised that I would make my videos shorter, and I think this is already going on too long. Uh, I'm gonna, but I didn't want to cut it short because I wanted to conclude the overview. Um, and then going forward, I'm gonna try to make the videos uh, much shorter. And uh, I don't know, guys. I'm excited. This looks like it's gonna be uh, all quite different than the U.S. campaign. Not only because of the different units, the, diff the fact that we have more, a lot more forces um, that we have to take advantage of. Like it's all about timing here, guys. We are on November 26, 1941. So we're gonna steam as quickly as possible to per to Pearl and I heard people say uh, that you can't possibly reach Pearl by December 7th which is kind of interesting but um, we'll try to steam at full speed and uh, get this going uh, we know what's, ha what's gonna happen next and then uh, yeah leave, uh, leave back your feedback and suggestions and comments on uh, what uh, how you how you would go about this as far as uh, where would you um, put your forces, how spread would you make them, uh, how would you distribute them, what would be their compositions, and uh, how how would you do like, how much would you focus on scouting, on raiding, uh, and things of that nature. I'm gonna go and uh, think about that. Um, and then we'll see you on the next one where we're gonna start the action guys so thanks for watching uh, and see you in the next one <laughs>